So this is the 25th lecture in this series about creating an international sustainable civilization. Um, and the last lecture was about, very specifically about Indonesia's recent, at that time, recent campaign and um, the way polarization is working in Indonesia. Now, I recommended in the last two lectures, a remedy for that, especially the lecture before the last one, would be university community engagement projects. And I worked with Jarut. We set out 16 or so steps in these projects. So I just encourage Indonesians. I think it's nice that they have an expectation of professors. So this um, video is about the West, and we do not have such an expectation, uh, expectation. And we have developed into a country over time. It wasn't originally in the US. Originally, liberal arts institutions were big and they were being created to promote democracy. But since then, we've become the world superpower. We have all of these um, huge universities, and that has changed the character of higher education. It's changed the relationship between the professors and the students and between the professorate and the public. And I think it's bad, and I think it's threatening democracy. I myself, my entire career after leaving home for, for college was always in liberal arts schools as an undergraduate, I went to two different liberal arts schools. I got my master's at a liberal arts school. I got my PhD at the same liberal arts school. I taught for one year in a community college. And then I started teaching at University of St. Thomas, small liberal arts school, College of St. Catharines. Now I teach at Lyon College. That's been my main career, 28 years. In the summers, I taught at the Anglo-American University in Prague one summer. I taught at a branch of the New York uh, uh, college system, but it was small and the classes were small. I taught in Bangladesh at a small liberal arts uh, Asia University for women. So this has been my life. Uh, my students at Asia University noticed right away that my techniques for teaching were different. And I know that was because of my training in liberal arts. Um, what I taught, how I taught it, the kinds of dialogues we had in class, the kinds of writing assignments, it was all very different than they had had and they, they asked, why don't we have more classes like this? And when I taught the uh, Greek civilization, which I think I'm gonna teach one more time, but when I worked out my own curriculum for teaching a class in the legacy of ancient Greek civilization, or when I taught Plato's dialogues, the students always said, why don't we have more classes like this? And one of the things that is a cornerstone of my classes are analogies and deep reading. They have to find their own analogies. They have to come to class telling, you know, explaining which people that they know fit these patterns. And then they're amazed to see that, wow, yeah, that fits. And they can see that these patterns really do exist. But that's that those are realities that the Enlightenment in the West tried to eliminate. And they did not succeed, but they certainly don't educate for them. And so we have a big problem. But anyway, um, this is about what's happened and the rise of universities and the corruption or the the fact that universities are not equipped or structured in a way 
that can help save democracy as well as they could be. And they are more and more they reward the professorate for being indifferent, not becoming engaged in political life like the ancient model of the obligation of the nobility and the Indonesian model of the obligation of the nobility in the sense of college educated. So that's what I want to, that's what I'll talk about. And um, I have some good, good um, articles about this that really hit home. Okay, so this is a continuation of this series of lectures. Um, this lecture is about a, the Western model of the professor as an observer. So this is a modern model of the professor is an observer of public life. They're detached and objective. So just like a scientist is supposedly a detached observer, they're objective, they're fact-based, they don't allow any sort of emotion to get caught up in what they're doing. Well, that's not true because what projects get funded? Who funds them? When they come to some knowledge, who takes that knowledge and uses it and what did they use it for? So it's simply not true that science can occur in a vacuum without a cultural context. And that was denial. Plus the Enlightenment wanted to create an entirely different culture so we can create a culture where it's actually used for good things. Well, anyway, what we actually have are the professorate who get rewarded for being detached observers and not seriously contributing to public life to preserve democracy. Um, so I think this model has contributed to the decline of democratic societies throughout the world, especially the Western, the free countries. When the best students go to graduate school in the West, they internalize this model during grad school and they become disengaged from their own societies. Instead of this, higher education should give students the skills necessary to go home and help their nations develop through science, medicine, social science research that helps to solve problems or else humanities, which enables us to recognize our common humanity, avoid the problems of the past, imitate the successes of the past and apply these patterns to current life. Why are the professors isolated? Even if they didn't want to be, the whole system, the professional rewards, you know, what do you get rewarded for? What might you lose your job if you don't do? Even if you have tenure, if you want to have any kind of status, what do you have to do? Um, what you study, how the subject is studied, the way of life among the professors that leads to the most status the source of funding for a large percentage of research. Even when the research doesn't take place in a corporation or in a military um, institution, even on college campuses, what sort of funding occurs, who pays for it? The demands of administrators who seek higher rankings for their institutions. So they're always putting pressure on the professors to follow the, the social norm so that they get these rewards, so that the college looks better, so that students will come, so that they'll pay their bills, right? So students will get better jobs because the college they went to was more prestigious, blah, blah, all right? It's all a money-based system. It's a business. Um, and it gets caught up in whatever makes money in the rest of the culture, the economic system of the broader culture. So what are the institutional problems? This was an article from the Chronicle of Higher Education 
the president of the MacArthur Foundation, a major, major foundation for grants for education. He says something is seriously wrong in the relationship between universities and the policy community in the field of international relations. There, this is where what you learn, you can use to benefit other people. It can be local, national, international. There's been a theoretical turn across the social sciences and humanities that has cut off academic discourse from the way ordinary people and working professionals speak and think. The validity and elegance of the models has become the focus rather than whether these models can be used to understand real world situations. And I got caught up in this horribly because Plato scholarship on Plato that gets rewarded is has nothing to do with life. And I don't think it's that anything to do with Plato. So it, it's been a real, it's been really difficult for me. Further, the incentive structure in universities and disciplines has endorsed this emphasis on theory and methodology. When it comes to promotions and awarding tenure, departments are allowed, largely allowed to set their own standards. The departments are made up of people who have succeeded in the profession and will perpetuate its values. This is where my personal experience is, again, unique. I taught, first of all, at a liberal arts school not at a research university. So I didn't have to publish in university presses and I didn't have to follow this, the paradigm. Second of all, I was in a program that was so small that it was a religion and philosophy program. There was one religion teacher and there was me and all of my, my sabbatical proposals any sort of money for summer activities or conferences. I had to show that this kind of scholarship was supporting my teaching. I was the only philosopher. And so I had to show that my scholarship was very interdisciplinary and very broad, you know, included an understanding of a lot of philosophers. It wasn't stuck in one little specialization. So even my work on the Greeks is not specialized work. It's work about the culture as a whole and about how the insights from the Greeks can be used today if you just use analogies. So that was the kind of thing my school was looking for, something the students could apply to their lives, but very, very rare, a very small percentage of professors in the U.S. had this sort of expectations and situation that I had. He's most concerned about the larger effects, the next generation. So again, just like Mr. Marif was concerned about teaching the next generation of professors, teaching them and they teaching the next generation of leaders. And he was, he just wants them to learn and perpetuate moderate Islam. He knows it's important. And that's the same with Mr. Gallucci. Um, what happens is um, the professors in graduate schools find a student that's just like them, and then they reward them, and then they replicate what, and the students imitate their mentors that's where they learn what's important. And then they're prepared for careers that don't exist outside of the academy. They're not functional. Um, policymakers are faced with irreducible complexity, radical uncertainty. They have to think practically. They would benefit from having multiple views of the same issue. Scholars could help policymakers by providing ways to assess whether their policies are working. They badly need evidence of progress on emerging problems. So, so I'm, a, I'm not a policymaker. To me, the humanities can be used to promote 
saving democracy and avoiding authoritarianism. And so that's how I think my training can be used to help other scholars in other countries and together we develop this culture of nurturing democracy and promoting the love of wisdom and time, knowledge, expertise to wisdom. So that's, I have my own version of this. It's not policy per se, but it's important in preserving democracy. Although this is a terrible problem in the United States, it's even worse to realize that the best and brightest students in developing countries are forced into thinking this way. The most intellectually gifted and educated citizens will be alienated from their nations, making them incapable and unwilling to lead their nations into the next generation. Instead of becoming a way Western nations that colonize the developing world, um, giving scholarships to the best students, so that they can go back and lift their nations up. The educational system has become one more way to maintain power by brainwashing the future intellectual elite in developing nations, teaching them to be these detached observers. Now, this is not true for the sciences. And it's, it's kind of one, you know, the social sciences can kind of go either way. But I think the humanities, it's too bad because the arts, it ought to be, the arts ought to be very multicultural. Um, maybe it's philosophy is the most notorious, which is very possible. Um, or to have university professors assume that religion is worthless. You shouldn't even study it in college. You should have given up before you ever got to college. You know, that sort of polarization is terrible. And university professors should not do that because they should care about preserving democracy. And so they should at least have, I mean, a basic respect for what those ancient wisdom traditions were up to. And yet in so many research in, uh, universities, there's this split. And, and there's secular universities. You never talk about religion um, or theology or anything like that. That's where the liberal arts schools were based on the union of reason and faith. So that's why I feel um, some, you know, that I can have dialogue with professors at UN schools in Indonesia is that they have a basic kind of holistic desire to have that kind of curriculum. Um, and so I can get on board with that. I understand that. Um, all right, but I do feel bad because I have read papers um, by students in Indonesia who've been trained in the West and they use all this jargon. All they want to do is get published, but it's inauthentic and it's so jargon driven. It's not they don't identify with it. They're jumping through somebody else's hoops. I just think it's really sad. And I think it is colonialism. It's the same, it's just a new wave of the same kind of brainwashing um, that went on before. To what extent do people in developing countries go to the West and earn learn this economic uh, model of the rational person as this calculator of their own self-interest. They exploit nature for human well-being. They constantly have to grow their economies. When this is suicidal, this is destroying their own countries. It's just, you know, bringing on climate change. How many thousands, tens of thousands of students in developing countries go to the West and learn this very toxic mechanistic model of economics? and take it back to their countries. I don't know, I hate to think about it, but again, it's got to change. It can't last like this. Here's the specifically the failure of the humanities disciplines. So the first article was about policy. This one is about humanities. 
um, article called Big Brain, Small Minds. So a philosophy professor and a classics professor say, we're on the verge of becoming the best trained and least educated society since the Romans and reducing the humanities to a type of soft science that will only hasten this. We are, we're, we're an empire in decline and yet we keep educating students in developing countries to follow this model. I, I have to believe that they don't sometimes come to the US and say, don't Americans actually read their own documents? Don't they read about Rome and think, gee, this is what the US is doing. Are you not noticing? <laughs> Maybe, okay, anyway, I don't know. As the sciences rightly grow, it's fine. The sciences, it's fine. A free society must ensure that criticism of the sciences also grows. That's what I'm saying about Aristotle. The intellectual virtues, the moral wisdom is over here and it has to be guided by the moral virtues, justice, practical wisdom has to guide the science. The humanities should not be judged by the metrics of hard science. Religion is a humanities discipline and philosophy tried to become a handmaiden of the sciences and that's where it lost its place i think it lost it no longer educates for the mind um or it tried to stop i don't know how much of this actually goes on but in theory they threw it out the philosophers threw it out um in practice who knows um my own undergraduate teacher as i've said before just told me to get get through grad school, hold your breath, do what you're told. And when you get tenure, you can write what you want. Because he, you know, he had a very traditional wisdom approach to things. Okay, so another article, How Humanities Can Help Fix the World. The United States is now producing an unprecedented number of bachelors, BAs who know little or nothing about humanistic thought, and a growing number of humanities PhDs who cannot find jobs. Consider this. Is it possible to have a society full of young people who are creative, energetic, entrepreneurial, technologically informed, and wholly comfortable with mass slaughter? Yes, I'm in the German department. So that's what he tries to teach, you know, that you can't keep teaching science and economics in this mechanistic way and be obsessed about economic growth, exploiting nature for human well-being, using social science to manipulate people, and not end up with people who are willing to do some pretty awful things. The Germans were excellent engineers <laughs> they engineered the holocaust that's a difficult project and so we should learn from history when western students are required to take some humanities class they rarely are given a choice or much of a choice of taking so-called religion classes too many professors do not think religion is a legitimate academic field of study. When it is, it's often studied as a detached observer, describing rituals, uh, foods, whatever, rather than understanding the relationship between a human being and the universe that is that these traditions were founded on that, the cultivation of noose, this connection, the divine noose, monism, and human noose, and trying to incarnate a life that's dedicated to the good, that makes you a, a flourishing member of a species in a universe that's understandable. They don't study it as if there's substance to all of this stuff. They just study it as detached observer. Oh, Muslims pray five times a day. 
and Catholics go to mass, you know, so what? <laughs> and and the underlying assumption was, you see, cultural relativism. Each society has different views, and our society is purely secular. And that's because, you know, all this hocus pocus was based on pre-scientific. Okay. Um, they ignore the Aristotelian virtues as a universal standard for future leaders. Facts are, are separated from values. Very, very few people teach this Aristotelian virtues-based understanding. That's why when I read about this conference, I was really happy because there are somebody and there, I think there's a growing number too. The corrupting influence of greed on the educational system. This is another thing that never gets brought up. The discipline of psychology has been lending its services to the military and government, as well as propaganda industries, such as advertising, public relations, and human management. So supposedly, again, the origin of social science, including psychology, was you study behavior in order to socially engineer people so they are virtuous. That was the goal. That is not what's happening. It's, did it ever happen? The Enlightenment uh, thinkers, especially John Stuart Mill, presented that, but was that ever what was going on? Um, Mr. Keltner, a positive psychologist at Berkeley, Berkeley, prestigious school, he gains wealth and fame from his motivational workshops. He's director of the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley. When asked whether positive psychology could be used for mass coercion, this is what he said. The vagus nerve, oxytocin, parts of the brain that are involved in, our, in compassion. That's our first task. That's the scientific motivation of positive psychology. And then cultures and societies and communities take science and push it in a lot of different directions. Nazism was an application of a lot of scientific ideas that have nothing to do with the science. But he should, you know, to be responsible, I think he should point that out. He should teach that people may have tragic good intentions. These science and social science are tools that can be used for good and evil. And as Aristotle pointed out, always have to be guided by practical wisdom. All he, he detaches himself from that, right? I'm just observer. It's not my fault. Whereas he, because of his study, should get out there and say, this really needs to be guided by wisdom. Here's how I think you should use it in this situation. Here's what I think are abuses, right? Here's political rhetoric that I think is using the vagus nerve. It's using different parts of the brain and it's triggering fear just to get votes and it's dividing our country, right? He could be doing that, and he's not. He just says, oh, everything's great. We can actually all be happy, and doesn't mention the downside, which is a mistake. And in Greek tragedy and poetry and mythology, there's always, this is the sacred passion. Here's how it gets abused, taken to extreme leads to ignoring, ignoring other people's claims to a flourishing life. Chris Hedges, he spent years traveling around the US trying to find the causes and the decline of our democracy. He argues that in the academic community, the corruption of language and the prominence of jargon is a major problem. The elite universities disdain honest intellectual inquiry. They organize learning around minutely specialized disciplines with a highly specialized vocabulary. The vocabulary thwarts universal understanding. It destroys the search for the common good. It allows students and faculty to retreat into their self-imposed fiefdoms 
and neglect the most pressing moral, political, and cultural questions. So this is where the conference at the Pontifical Academy was very counterculture to what the vast majority of universities reward, expect, demand, and um, institutionalize for the professorate. They're not supposed to talk. They're, they actually destroy their jargon, has no effort to search for any common good. They're completely wrapped up in what 12 other professionals say, and they've got their university press and their journal. I mean, I had this, every Plato scholar, you have to find something new to say about Plato. Well, pfft, anything new is either trivial or wrong. <laughs> the things about Plato that are important are that they're the same old patterns, right? We're just repeating the same stuff. That's what Plato's trying to tell us. But you can't write a dissertation saying that. You have to find something new. So I had to figure out how to play the game. And my advisor wanted me to write a whole book on one third of one platonic dialogue and just fundamentalist go through every quote and all that. It was very painful. I hated it, but I wanted that degree. So, um, so I did it, but what you're supposed to do after that, it's on Plato's Phaedo, okay? Find every, when you're doing your dissertation, you read everything that's ever been written about Plato's Phaedo, or especially more recently. So when you get your degree, you're connected with these other people who do Plato's Phaedo, and you could spend the rest of your life splitting hairs about Plato's Phaedo. And you could even say, well, I didn't study that argument in the Phaedo. I studied this argument. I didn't study that part of the argument. I studied this part. Oh my gosh. I mean, if you lived your life like that, can you imagine like spending your whole life obsessed about, I don't know, something trivial, but it's not the way you should live. It's not healthy. It's a very unhealthy uh, way for the members of our species to live. Like we're supposed to be curious about everything, try to understand things, try to educate ourselves about everything, try to educate each other. It's exactly the reverse. And so there's no common good. That's why the conference at the Pontifical Academy was all about what is the common good? Also, the religious leaders, they said, are important because they have a lot of impact on a lot of people and a lot of less educated people. They're the ones that really have contact with people and they can make a difference in the quality of life in their society and the preservation of democracy, where the professors are just sitting in their offices talking in jargon about something that's entirely useless. And a lot of them are proud of that fact. It's just really hard on me. It's so, I find it very offensive because, well, it shows you don't read history either. So what Mr. Hedges says, one of the signs of a dying civilization is that its language breaks down into exclusive dialects with, which prevent communication. A growing healthy civilization uses language as a daily tool to keep the machinery of society moving. The role of responsible literate elites is to aid and abet that communication. So that's what I tried to do in these lectures. That's what I'm trying to do, trying to find common ground and a, and a common language that is something we use in our minds. We use day to day. Um, it's not separated from daily life. It just gives you the, the chance to reflect on daily life and see what's actually there, which you wouldn't know if you weren't educated. But other than that, it helps you function. Um, so 
So this is part of our dying civilization. And we keep, we keep um, uh, attracting um, the best and the brightest from abroad and training them. Now, again, it's okay if it's the sciences, but the humanities and, and the sciences and social sciences need to be guided by wisdom or they can get used and they are getting used to do some wicked things, be driven by greed, power, influence, or destroy the earth. Uh, they can be used for political manipulation, whatever. So the humanities are dying in the US because the enlightenment wanted to throw out the notion of a mind, a microcosm and the macrocosm. And it really absolutely has to be revived or we won't make it to the 22nd century. Okay. So I worry about the professorate in the United States um, and talking to students, colleagues in Indonesia. I hope that they can avoid Again, some of the mistakes that we make that are very flagrant, pretty obvious.